different face on the stage today because Will decided it was too cold and wanted to go to Florida. So you get me and Sandy, and hopefully we have a joyful noise coming out of us. Sheila, Sheila's always here. Wait. You know, the, the best part about here. Sheila, guys, she's always on key. Always, <laughs> definitely. Father, we thank you so much for your love, for your grace, and your mercy. And Lord, as we get together here today and we come to worship you, Lord, you're here amongst us. And, and, and just let us come into your presence. Let us honor you today with who we are and what we say and what we do. Let us just lift up this joyful noise to you. In your name we pray, amen. Stand with us. Hold on. I'm not on. See what happens when we don't have will? That sound better? Oh, 
unfailing love each morning for I am trusting you show me where to walk for I give myself to you Away. 
Welcome to church, everybody. Okay. I hope everyone has had a fantastic week this week. Best week ever? Pretty close. Every week should be the best week ever. It is, right? Just like every day is the best day ever. You did survive. It, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> if, if people ask you how how did how is how are you doing today, and you tell them it's the best day ever, you get some interesting responses. You're like, really? Okay, yeah, today's the best day ever. Because you know what? You know what day I can live? Today, right? We can't live in yesterday. We can't even live for tomorrow. We can only live for today. And God gives us today. And as we talked about last week, what did we talk about last week? Trust in the Lord, right? Don't worry about what? Don't worry about tomorrow. I'm glad that you guys studied. <laughs> but God is good. God is always good. Um, God is better to us than we deserve. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, for sure. Um, and as such, when we spend time together, we are doing what? spend time with the Lord, but we're spending time together, and part of spending time together is part of Scripture, right? There's a Scripture that I laid out almost five years ago. Anyone know what it is? Acts 2.42. We devoted ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, right? As spiritual disciplines, as things we're supposed to do, the church is supposed to fellowship with one another. Fellowship with one another. It's a fancy word for just hanging out spending time with one another, like pouring ourselves into each other. That's what the church is designed for. So we love one another, encourage one another, and just be with one another. So April 1st, on Saturday, we have a senior lunch. Where's it at? First Baptist, right? First Baptist. So if you can make it on April 1st at noon, show up. It's a free meal. And we get to fellowship with other believers from other churches. Right? And hopefully we, we start getting some people that aren't churched, unchurched folks, joining for the senior lunches as well. It's a senior soup lunch. And it's a good time. It's fun. It's time to know more people in the church throughout the community. So we are the church. Right? Welcome to church. Is it welcome to Holly Naz or is it welcome to church? And our next one here is May 20th. So May 20th, we will, everything will be figured out on who's running it, and who's running our kitchen, who's cooking our soups. I will not be here. Uh-oh. Well, it'll, you know, it, it'll, it'll be perfect. Because we have so many people in the church that want to do what? Help and volunteer. You know, it, it's just when we go to church... And when pastors talk, you know, pastors are always interested. Well, how big is your church? How many people you got? Yeah, that's, that's what's funny. It's, you know, interesting. Because we got about 30 people that, you know, kind of rotate in and out. And the weeks that everyone shows up, you feel like there's a lot of people here. But then I, I, turn, I turn, the, 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 turn it around a little bit. I say, so how much, what's the percentage of your congregation that wants to volunteer? Yeah, yeah I got like 98% of the people that want to volunteer, right? Everybody's here and wants to help, which is awesome. I thank you for all of that. Uh, what do we do on a good Friday? Breakfast. What time? 9.30. So if you had the day off and you want to be here, at 9.30 we're going to have a potluck breakfast. So we're going, to, we're going to fellowship, break bread together, and we're going to talk about... Well, we're, going to talk about we're going to talk about what happens on Good Friday, right? Specific, specifically... Ed's going to go through the story, whether Ed tells it as a story or Ed reads it or however. We're going to discuss the story of what happened on Good Friday, right? 
one of the only reasons we're here is because of what happened on Good Friday. And we're not together and, 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 um, without that. Then, we'll be together in the morning. We'll, we'll shout, fellowship together in the morning. We'll, we'll share a meal in the morning. And, and later on that night at 6.30, we're going to have a Euchre tournament. Again, opportunities to be with believers. Do we need believers? Do we need, yeah, absolutely, we need people. Whether we want to admit it or not, we need to be with people. That's, that's the church. You can't be doing what God has asked you to do unless you're with believers. You ever hear the command, love one another? How do you love one another if you're all by yourself? You can't even do that, right? The simplest thing. Can I get my usher to come forward? Carry right. So what I have in my hand is a mortgage statement. Yeah. Ouch, right? Pray that God will not only meet all of our needs, but will exceed our needs. God will exceed our needs. Not just, not just enough. God says he can do infinitely more than we ask or think. As such, I'd love to just rip this mortgage statement up once and for all, have somebody write me a check, and pay off the whole thing. I'm asking for a lot. But why not, right? God, you'll take care of everything. We give to God, and he gives us more. He always provides. We always have enough infinitely. Always have enough. Sometimes Ed, our treasurer, looks at me and says, you know, we're not going to make our payment. Not worried about it. Next week. You know what? We made our payment. God always provides. Always provides. Father, we thank you for the very air that we breathe. We thank you for the very air that we breathe, Lord. Without you, we are nothing. And Lord, you ask that we give a small portion back to you. And Holy Spirit, I I ask you to help us to be joyful givers when we give back to you. We say thank you, Lord, so much for everything you've done for us. And we give to you as an act of worshiping you because you've done so much for us, more than we can, we can even begin to imagine. Lord, I ask that you take these tithes, you take these offerings, and you multiply them to do infinitely more than I can even begin to imagine so that we can be your church, so that we can be the light on the hill, and we can be the beacon that people look to. In your name we pray, amen. How do we give God our stuff? What's that? Talk to him? How do we give God our stuff? We leave it in the hall? Yeah. Well, well, give me your water bottle. This is your stuff. Not you, not people personally. How do we give God our stuff? Give it to one another. Tithe. We tithe. We give it to the church. Right? We give it to the church. Now, the church building is the representation of the temple of God. Especially to who? Unbelievers. Right? When believers look at the church, you get some unbelievers. You ever have a, an unbeliever say, you know what, I can't walk in the church because I'm going to burst in flames? Yeah, exactly. So they believe that this is a representation of the temple of God, that God resides here. We happen to know better. We know that God is where? Everywhere, right? And the, he does not live within the four walls. However, the physical representation to the world is the church, the building itself. When we give God our stuff, we have to give God to, we have to give our stuff to where? Sorry. The building. And what do we give God when we give to the building? Yeah, what do we give them? All the
all that we have, and our best. Our best stuff. Absolutely our best stuff. We don't give God our seconds. We give God our best. When the church has a need, we meet it with excellence. We don't just go. If I, if I need tools for the church, do I go buy Harbor Freight tools? I buy the good tools, right? I bring the good tools to church. And as I was thinking about this, you know, yeah, I, I buy stuff for the church all the time. I don't, it's, it's, it's just something I do. And when I, first, when I first took over as pastor, I sat in my chair in my office and almost fell out of it. It was so bad. You're like, oh my, this is crazy. What it, why do we even have this in the pastor's office? So I go to, I go to Office Depot I look around, and I sit in all these chairs, and I find the right one. Oh, this, is a really, this is a really nice chair. I like this chair. I look at the price tag and go, oh. I look around again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I get back to the same chair and go, oh, and this chair is just awesome. Now, I'm, I have a, a decision to make. I can buy that chair, grab my chair from home, which is not as nice, or bring it to the church, or I can put the nice chair where? In my office. That's where the nice chair is. It's in my office. Now, you know, now that I'm spending more time in my office because of being able to work hybrid and, and, and remote at times, it's kind of nice to have the really nice chair there. But when I wasn't doing that, I hardly used it. But the best belongs where? Here. When we give stuff to God, where does it go? here, right? It goes here. The church is the physical representation of the temple of God. And God wants nothing but the best. Nothing but the best. And let's read in Nehemiah. Let's, let's open our Bibles to Nehemiah. And we'll see that God wants the best stuff. He wants the best stuff. Now, I want to go over just a, a little bit about what's going on in Nehemiah at this point. Open your Bibles to Nehemiah 10. So, in Nehemiah, the Israelites have just spent roughly 70 years as exiles in Babylon. They're not in their country. They've been pulled out of their country. They're in exile. They want to go back home. And God had told them, you know what? You're going to be in exile for approximately... 70 years. He told them that through the prophet Jeremiah. So the Israelites know prophecy. They know that the prophet Jeremiah said, look, you're going to spend 70 years in Babylon, and then you're going to be able to go home. Now, about 150 years before Jeremiah, we have the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah says, you know what? You guys are going to go in exile, and God's going to use a Persian king, Cyrus, Names him, gives him his name, and he's going to use this guy to bring you home. You think the Jews knew what prophecy was? Yeah, absolutely. They know the word. They know what prophecy is. You know what they're expecting? They're expecting to be brought home. They're expecting God to be true to his word. They're trusting God. They're in exile. They, granted, they don't want to be in exile. A whole, a whole generation goes by. Almost two generations go by. But they're expecting to come back. Now, imagine this. They're expecting to come back, and a Persian king is the one that's supposed to send them back, right? And right now they're in a, in a, in a province that is Babylonian. You know how long it took Cyrus to take over Babylon? It was like a day. It was incredible. I, if, you look at, if you look at history, unheard of. Here's this world power. Next thing you know, it falls with an incredible lightning speed, and who took it over? Cyrus, of Persia. So when we're reading Nehemiah here, the Jews are not just thinking about prophecy anymore. They're living it. Would you be excited to be living in the middle of prophecy and know it? Absolutely. I would too. Let's start with Nehemiah, verse 30, 10, 32. Actually, I want to start at verse 28. Sorry. 
Then the rest of the people, the priests, Levites, gatekeepers, and singers, temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the pagan people of the land in order to obey the law of God. The rest of the people, right, they separated themselves. Verse 29. All the people joined their leaders and bound themselves with an oath. They swore a curse on themselves if they failed to obey the law of God as issued by his servant Moses. How would you, would, do you do that? Would you swear a curse on yourself if you failed to obey God's law? That's what they just did here. They solemnly promised to carefully follow all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. Here's what they promised to do. We promise not to let our daughters marry the pagan people of the land, and not to let our sons marry their daughters. We also promise that if the people of the land should bring any merchandise or grain to be sold on the Sabbath, or any other holy day, we will refuse to buy it. Every seventh year, we will let our land rest, and we will cancel all debts owed to us. In addition, in addition, we promise to obey the command to pay the annual temple tax of one-eighth of an ounce of silver for the care of the temple of God. This will provide for the bread of presence, for the regular grain offerings and burnt offerings, for the offerings on the Sabbath, the new moon celebrations, and the annual festivals, for the holy offerings, and for the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel. They will provide for everything necessary for the work of the temple of our God. We promise to pay what? The temple tax. This is not a tithe. This is the temple tax. What if I, if I made Sheila pay for our electrical bill here as your tax? That's, what, that's basically what's going on here, right? They're providing for the things that the temple needs. Not, this, is, this, is, this is above and beyond a tithe. This is demanded by God for the running of what? The temple, yeah. And the, and the church is what? Representation, representation of the temple of God. They vow to pay it because God needs it. And they're vowing to pay it out of what? Out of love for God. Out of love for God, absolutely. Verse 34, we have cast sacred lots. We've cast sacred lots to determine when, at regular times each year, the families of the priest, Levites, and the common people should bring wood to God's temple and be burned on the altar of the Lord our God, as is written in the law. So I'm going to take out my dice. I'm going to roll my dice. And whoever... Sheila, guess what? You get to clean the church next week. It's providing for the church, right? Bringing, they're bringing wood to the temple, casting lots to do so. But again, they need wood for what? Sacrifices, right? As part of running the temple. You have to have this stuff. To run the, you can't have a temple without it. The church doesn't run without it. So we solemnly swear that We swear that we're going to bring the wood when we're supposed to, as part of our devotion to God. Now we get into verse 35. We promise to bring the first part of every harvest to the Lord's temple year after year, whether it be a crop from the soil or from our fruit trees. We agree to give God our oldest sons and the firstborn of all our herds and flocks as prescribed in the law. We will present them to the priests who minister in the temple of our God. We will store the produce in the storerooms of the temple of our God. We will bring the best, we will bring the what? The best of our flour and other grain offerings. The best of our fruit. The best of our new wine and olive oil. And we promise to bring the Levites a tenth of everything our land produces. For it is the Levites who collect the tithes in all our rural towns. We promise to bring God the what? The best. What are we supposed to bring to God? The best. Not the second best, not something else, but the best. If we choose to give our entire lives to God, why do we choose to give God second best? An old vacuum, yeah. We give God our second best. We do it all the time. Sometimes we don't even think about it. It is a very true statement, right? 
I can sit up here and I can vow to give God my entire life. God, I'm going to give you all of me, but don't touch my stuff. God, here I am. Take my life. Let me do your will. Oh, but I, nope, this is my stuff. It happens all the time. The temple is represent, the temple. The church is represent, the representation of the temple of God. Our stuff, our stuff is extremely physical, is it not? So when we give God, when we give the church our stuff, it's a very physical representation of our devotion to who? To God. Verse 39. A priest, a descendant of Aaron, will be with the Levites as they receive these tithes. And a tenth of all that is collected as tithes will be delivered by the Levites to the temple of our God and placed in the storerooms. The people of the Levites must bring these things, must bring these offerings of grain, new wine, and olive oil to the storerooms and place them in the sacred containers near the ministering priests, the gatekeepers, and the singers. We promise together not to neglect the temple of our God. We promise together not to neglect the temple of God. As believers, we should promise together to do what? Not to neglect what? The temple of God. And what represents the temple of God? Our church. Absolutely. Our church. This building should be in excellent condition all the time. All the time. The church seldom is. Because we don't treat it better than we treat our stuff. Our own stuff. I've been in the church for a couple years. I've seen the church be given junk. I bought this brand new TV for my house. Here's my old tube TV. Okay, why'd you buy a new TV? Well, you know, my, 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 that old TV, the, the, it's always showing up red and yellow and you really can't see. Why'd you bring it to the church? You bought a brand new TV for your house. You think, if you think the church needs a TV, guess what? Buy another one. A nicer one than the one you bought for your house. What? Pastor Dan, you're out of your mind. No, I'm not. I'm not. Because stuff is very, very important to us. God knows it's very, very important to us. When it talks about giving, when it talks about stuff, when we talk about money, you know what Scripture talks about the most? Stuff. There's more about money in this book than there's about prayer. Almost four times as much. I know, isn't that crazy? It's true, though, because it's physical. It means something to us. And when I give God, say, here, God, here, it's yours. Thank you so much for everything. And I give it back to him, and I buy stuff, and I give him the best of stuff. A physical representation means a ton to us. It's huge. We start thinking differently about the, the building, about the temple of God. I promise to give God my best. Not my second, not my third, not my fourth, but my best. The people of Israel did not do that. Let's flip over to Malachi, and we'll see that God does not want anything but the best. Flip over to Malachi 1. Now, there's a debate about Malachi of when it was written. However, throughout the debates, almost everybody believes that the book of Malachi is written real close to the time of Nehemiah. We're not sure if it's a 40, 50 year span, but it's, it's within a small time frame. There's not hundreds of years that go by when Malachi is written. So here we have the Jews saying, we promise to give God our best. We promise to give God our best. We promise to give God our best. Now we're going to walk into the book of Malachi. and see that they failed to do what they promised. Malachi 1, verse 6. The Lord of heaven's army says to the priests, 
A son honors his father, and a servant respects his master. If I'm your father and master, where are the honor and respect I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. This is God speaking. If I am your father and master, is God our father and master? Should be, right? Where are my honor? Where is the honor and respect I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my, on my altar. Well, then you ask, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defiled them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you gave blind animals the sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor. How's that going to go over? Yeah. And see how pleased he is, says the Lord of Heaven's armies. Go ahead. Beg God to be merciful to you. Go ahead and beg God to be merciful to you. But when you bring that kind of offering, why should he show any favor to you at all? Ask the Lord of Heaven's armies. God, help me. God, give to me. God, please, 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 please. Let me give you my junk. We want God to bless us, do we not? And God said he would bless us, did he not? But if we're not doing what God has asked us to do, should he bless us? No. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, didn't we? What do you want from God? And are you doing what you're supposed to do to get it? God says, I will bless your socks off if you do what? If you tithe. That's actually, he says it in Malachi. We're not going to get there, but that's what he says. I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but that's what it says. Verse 10. How I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of Heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offering. But my name is honored. My name is honored by people of other nations from morning till night. All around the world, they offer sweet incense and pure offerings in honor of my name. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of heaven's armies. But you dishonor my name with your actions. By bringing contemptible food, you are saying it's all right to defile the Lord's table. You say it's too hard to serve the Lord. And you turn your noses up at my commands, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Think of it. Animals that are stolen and crippled and sick are being presented as offerings. Should I accept from you such offerings as these? Ask the Lord. Cursed, cursed is the chief who promises to give a fine ram from his flock and then sacrifices the defective one to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and my name is feared among the nations. What did the nation of Israel do? Gave God blind and defective sacrifices. And what did God say they should do instead? Give him the best. But if you're not going to give the best, what should you do? Close the doors. Just close the doors of the temple. If you're not going to give me your best, then just don't even bother. you think it's any different for us than it is for them? The nation of Israel is God's chosen people. We are believers. That makes us God's chosen people. This is not law of Moses stuff. This is outside the law. Outside the law, God is, still wants the best. The best. The best of our stuff. Again, not just the best. He wants the best of me, too. But along with the best of me, should follow with my physical representations of bringing my physical stuff to the church, which is, the, what is, is the, the representation of what? The temple of God. So when people walk into our building, what do they see? Hmm? The best. Do they see the best? The 
when you walk around this place, you absolutely see the best when you walk around this place. It's true. The answer is no. You don't. Why is that? Why don't we give God our best stuff? Because we're selfish. Absolutely right. Because we don't want to. It's mine. <laughs> it's so easy to have faith in God. When we give God our best, you know, that's like faith in action. That's what God wants to see. He wants the best. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible to me because when God says we, when we give to him, he's going to do what? He's going to bless our socks off. We don't give to get our socks, get to get the blessing, but if you're willing to give God your best, and God is the good father, the great father, the awesome father, you're going to give back, just like I give back to my children, right? My children give me attitude, do I give them the best? No. Now, my kids are loving, and then, you know, Dad, I love you. Like, what do you want? <laughs> but my kids respect me. My kids love me. I'm willing to, I want to give them everything. I want to give them the world. And they give me their junk. I don't want to give them anything. How is God any different than me? Granted, he has much more patience than I do. But God wants our best stuff. That's our best stuff. My wife is laughing at me. <laughs> I am laughing with her, yes. <laughs> God wants our best. And the message hasn't changed since the beginning. Let's go to Genesis 4 just to see, just for fun. Genesis 4. Right from the beginning, God wants our best. Genesis 4, 2. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the land. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift the best portions of his firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. Why did the Lord not accept Cain and his gift? They were not the best, right? He brought some. Here's my harvest. I guess I'll just come over here and just grab some stuff and give to God. Why did he like Abel's offering? It was the best. The best and the, the firstborn... The best of the best. Here, God, I'm going to give it to you. Right from, the, right from the beginning. How many times did God change his mind then? He didn't at all. Exactly, right? Not at all. Not one bit. He still wants our best. As believers, as Christians, he wants the best of our stuff. Not just me. Here, God, you get me. I'm going to keep my stuff, though. Are we really giving it, to, giving it to God? No. No. All in, all in as a believer means I'm going to give God the best stuff that he's given to me. I'm going to use my resources and give it back to him. He wants our best. He wants it. I'm going to challenge each and every one of you to look around this building and honestly take a look at it, honestly see it as... This is the representation of the temple of God. And as a representation of the temple of God, does this place scream the best? The answer is no. It doesn't, you don't have to look very hard for an answer to be no. Which means there's a mindset that has to be changed in each one of us. So that this place screams excellence. It could be an old building. And it is an old building. But it should be clean. It should be neat. Everything in here should be in working order. Because this is a representation of God. 
especially to unbelievers. Unbelievers walk in here, they look in here, and they see stuff that is outdated, okay, that's fine. If it's outdated and dirty, if it's dingy, if it's gross, what does that make me think of the people who worship here? That they don't care. That's exactly it. Right? And it takes all of us. This is a building that is five times the size of my house, or six times, or ten times, or whatever it is, right? It takes the church to take care of the church. It takes the people in the church, each taking ownership of this place as a temple of God. If you can't, if you don't, if you, if, you, if you see something that is out of place, guess what? Do it. Put it in place. If you can't see something that's out of place, ask my wife, she'll tell you. And then you can put it in place. It's the stuff. It's this. Yes, it's only a building. But this represents the temple of God. When people come in here and use it, which they often do. Yesterday we had a whole bunch of people in here using it for a baby shower. That was like, yes, they were all here and they were probably had a good time, didn't they? But see, it's the thing, is we open our building to the public, and when we open our building to the public, the public comes in here and they see it. And I want them to see that this place is fantastic and excellent and clean. Because this represents the temple of God. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And, and Lord, help each one of us to give you the best of our stuff. To give you the best stuff. When, that when there's a need, we don't just need it with subpar stuff. We need it with excellence. We give to you the best. And we do it out of, out of our love and devotion because you've given us your best. And, and just to be thankful to you, help us to, to give back our best. Lord, once again, we love you so much. We thank you so much for for loving us. We thank you for the, the, the infinite patience that you have with us. And Holy Spirit, help us to, to be people that that want to, that, that absolutely want to, that desire to give you the best stuff that we have available. And in Jesus we pray. Amen.